Coming up on Theater Talk. Audience can tell when they're in the presence of a truth that was discovered just for them, and they can tell when you've recycled something. Ah. Uh. They can smell it. They can feel it. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Susan, there was a debate about a new Broadway musical called Shuffle Along, or the making of the musical sensation of 1921, and all that followed. And the debate was, for the Tony Awards, is Shuffle Along a revival of Shuffle Along from 1921, or is it a new musical that is taking a look at the importance of Shuffle Along? I think the debate is immaterial because what it is is a great new American musical at the Music Box, directed by our good friend and created by our good friend George C. Wolf. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Theater Talk. Glad to be here. Starring Tony nominated, the beautiful Adrian Warren as Gertrude Saunders and Florence Mills. Yes, hello. We all are going to wear your dress when this <laughs> <laughs> Okay, deal. <laughs> and also starring as UB Blake, one of the creators of Shuffle Along, our good friend Brandon Victor Dixon. Welcome I back. I put the dress on before we start. <laughs> I know, you look fabulous in Della, I must say. <laughs> Brandon Victor Dixon, welcome to Theater Talk. Um, all right, George, what was it that got you, inspired you, got you thinking about doing a musical about something that many of us had forgotten about, an old 21 review. We love the songs, we love the, the music from it, but who was, gave Shuffle Along a thought in all these years? Well, that, because we all had forgotten it, and that's why I wanted to, and the more I researched about it, and the more I got to know inside of it, the more I, I found it really fascinating that something that was so monumentally significant in 1921, 63rd, it was at the 63rd Street Theater, that great theater, hello, and, uh, <laughs> and 63rd was a two-way street. They turned 63rd Street into a one-way street because the traffic was so busy with people rushing to see Shuffle Along. It had three touring companies. It made $9 million. It ran for 504 performances. It integrated Broadway. It was the first time there was a jazz score. So how, and it was the first time that a women's chorus on Broadway was like a hoofing dancing chorus as opposed to being decorative. Right. So it had all these innovations and, 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 and both cultural and, and in terms of American musical theater and in terms of New York City, how could something that was so culturally significant end up a footnote that was a footnote to a footnote? Right. And so that became, and just that dichotomy became really, really fascinating to me. And then the more I read about it, the more I realized that it was embraced by uptown and downtown, by highbrow and lowbrow critics. George G. Nathan came to see it five times. Mm -hmm. Langston Hughes came to Columbia University because he wanted to go see Shuffle Along. So it's, it had all these, these fans that were, that were extraordinary. Paul Robeson was a replacement. Josephine Baker tried to join when she was 15. She couldn't get in, so she <laughs> snuck into a road company. And I, all these stories just became more and more intriguing to me. And I went, this sings. Hello, hello. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a musical. And, hey, kids. And, but why do you think it became a footnote? If it had that impact, why did it fall, fall by the wayside? Because history is written by those who survive, and a lot of people didn't. And also, I think that there was a revival in 1933 that was not so well received because talkies were taking over and it was the depression was going on and then it was an ill-fated one that happened in 1952 and sort of it's it's southern it's southernisms and also i think they lost control of the show producers put in new songs throughout the book uh, and it just it, it so it it wasn't viewed favorably by the times right not the times times but the times right. the days so it, i i think that didn't help but also it's it's 1921 and it's an all-black show, and it's about a southern town, and it's hokey and foolish, but it's also a brilliant score. So I think time was not kind because time is frequently not kind to shows that are significant. And well, it that's gave us, telling us. And it gave us the standard I'm just wild about Harry. Exactly. Now, Adrian and, and Brandon, you guys are probably musical theater <clears throat> kids, right? You know, yes. grow up 
We'll see. We'll, we'll see where you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not calling you a show queen. Just relax. <laughs> no, no, no. You just admitted you tried on Adrian's dress. I know you did. It's not about that. It's, it's not about too late that. now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Did you have any any idea what Shuffle Along was when you were a kid growing up, learning about musicals and wanting to be? No musicals? idea. I didn't know anything about the show until. I started talking to George about it. And then I felt horrible that I didn't know this history because it's my history. Mm -hmm. It's all of our history. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know either. And I mean, I, one of the reasons I, that it was a joke, but I, I mean, as much as I've, I've, I've done music theater and I've grown up with certain chunks of it, there are significant gaps in my knowledge of musical theater, the history of musical theater and certain shows. I mean, he's nodding his head because he scoffs at me when he makes certain references that I do. <laughs> but, uh... Sweeney Todd. Uh, yeah. <laughs> come on, come on. I got that one. Yeah, West Side Story. <laughs> anyway. But no, I didn't, I didn't know about Shuffle Along at all either. And, and so the more that we, I learned about it once, once once I, I started doing the show and then in these conversations with George and as, as they sh we shared research materials amongst um, each other, it, it, everything he said is, is correct. It's like everybody needs to know. Yeah. We knew about it because of Josephine Baker, because exactly. John Claude Baker would talk to us about I met uh -huh. I met Bricktop. Oh, really? Well, wow. Brick Top, who was in Shuffle Along, she's mentioned. She, she was yeah. a performer. She yeah. Was, yeah. She's mentioned Ricky in the show. Bricktop. And I haven't thought about it, but I, you know, I knew Jean Claude Baker, who had the restaurant Shea, mm -hmm. uh, Shea yes. Josephine, shrine to his mother, Josephine Baker. I've known him since 1989, and Bricktop was still alive in the early 90s, and she would come down, and he would introduce. You remember how flamboyant he was? Yeah. He would introduce my beloved Bricktop, <laughs> and she'd come in, and people were like. Nobody knew. No, yes, yeah. nobody knew. Nobody yeah. knew. No, How no, no. And, and that's what happens. I'm, in fact, I, find a, I found a journal entry from a woman writer whose name I've forgotten who wrote about Lottie G, who Audra plays. And it was during the 1920s. We arrived in Paris at 4 o'clock, found ourselves at Brick Tops. Uh, Lottie G, too much champagne and not in good voice, but sang her hit song from Shuffle Along, and we all cheered like mad. And it's just this wonderful slice of life, and it's, it's just so thrilling to know that once upon a time, there was this extraordinary world where, 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 where uptown and downtown, where, where Broadway art, artists, th there, was a, there was a midnight show that was added to Shuffle Along. My favorite thing is said, midnight show starts at 11.30. That was added <laughs> because Fanny Bryce campaigned uh, Flora Noah Miller and said, we want to come see the show, but we're on the same schedule. Oh. Right. So a midnight show was added and it was packed every single, every single Wednesday night with all these celebrities. Al Jolson, each, each Wednesday night would buy 200 tickets and just get people to be. So there was just this incredibly wonderful time where, where Broadway was, Broadway was exploding with all these possibilities and energies and rhythms and music. And so we wanted to celebrate that and that's what Shuffle Along is. So then I wondered what happened. But if one looks at it almost anthropologically yes, or sort of, yes. that what I think it would end up happening, Shuffle Along, the score is much more sophisticated than the book. Mm -hmm. But then uh, that's the case of but a that lot was of all the shows, right. all the that twenty all years the shows, ago. Yeah. Yeah. But but I think w what ended up happening, a lot of the influences, uh, the, a lot of the influence that Shuffle Along had, got absorbed by other show. Florence Ziegfeld hired the chorus girls from Shuffle Along to right. teach his chorus girls how to dance. Will Volderay, who did the vocal arrangements, was also hired by Flo Ziegfeld to to do orchestrations for the Ziegfeld Follies for the ensuing years and also was brought in to do a uh, showboat. Right. So what ended up happening, you know, there's a line in the show, you know, the, the, the best of shuffle alone got eaten alive by more famous shows. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that's fundamentally what happens. And musicals were searching for an identity. They, they were a, a little form, bit, really. A form, a real form. And there was, there was melodrama, and then there'd be operetta, and then there'd be a little bit of vaudeville, then there'd be a little bit yep. of tin shows and, and minstrel shows. And then, and then was it four years later, you have Showboat, which, has, which figured out a, a slightly more, well, a significantly more significant, sophisticated form. Right. And then by that time, everything else became a dinosaur, and they either survived be generally because of the quality of the score, but not because of the quality of the right. show. I want to delve into the the characters because they're 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 fascinating. Um, you play two, Adrian. Yes. And the one I'm most curious about, though, because um, there's a tragedy there, is is Florence Mills, yes. who becomes a star because of Shuffle Along, and and I believe the history of it. She's a, a nobody when she shows up for the audition, right? She's she's been performing for a while, but she's basically a no one by the time she auditions for Shuffle Along, and she knows it's her one opportunity to get to the next level. 
And, um, and when she auditions, it's no one's ever heard a voice like her. She's a very bird-like voice, very soft and uh, demure personality. And um, when she actually performs, I think the entire cast initially thought, how would she ever replace Gertrude Saunders, who I play in Act One, right. which is very Who's brassy. Who's loud and brassy. And Who's brassy and a real exactly. shoulder exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and this, this tiny 100-pound girl comes on stage and has standing ovation after standing ovation every time she sings and from goes on from shuffle along becomes huge internationally and she really becomes the first black superstar. i want to say superstar she appeared on broadway then she appeared in london and there were all these people writing reviews we don't want her all these racist statements that were made and she walks on stage sings one song and the entire audience leaps to their feet cheering so she becomes a huge star there then she goes to paris she becomes a huge star there i think she was Piaf meets Billie Holiday meets Judy Garland, <laughs> yeah. but with this incredibly fragile voice, and then died very, 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 very young, young. Yeah. extraordinarily yeah. very young. And there's not one recording. I was going to ask of you, her. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, is there a recording of her? Any no. you can clip of her? No, <laughs> we don't know what she really no, sounded like. Sound no. Which is, and Adrian found found this fact, <laughs> yeah. which is the one time they tried to. One of the times they really tried to record her voice was on the stage of the music box. Mm. Oh, really? Now, uh, uh, Brandon, you're UB Blake, yes, and he was actually the one person from Shuffle of Long who became f famous again, but later in life because I remember UB. Remember that? Yes, that, exactly. Yeah. And also, and also and because people, of the sting a, and all, all, right, and all that's the stuff. Right, that's right. There was a resurgence of, 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 of like acknowledgement of ragtime music and, right. and jazz music, and so it kind of just kind of came up. UB really lived this somewhat, you know, semi-charmed kind of life. You know, UB's talent was and, and and the music was always his focus, it was his love and his heart. And with that, he managed to negotiate his way through some very difficult times. Mm -hmm. But and even through the fallow periods of his career, you know, he wasn't out beating down doors. People came to him. Mm -hmm. You know, people came to UB and were immediately charmed by the love and the joy and the spirit of UB. I mean, I, I've been meeting people outside after after the show who said they met him when they were doing UB. He lived to be like 93, yeah. 94, something like it's, that. It's up for debate. Uh, some, say, <laughs> some say 100. Yeah. It was actually, I, I read that he added four years, so he actually died when he was 96. But 100 is a much better slogan. <laughs> he lived to be 100, yes. <laughs> so anyway, so you, you, you've run into people who and they, knew they, just, they talk about, you know, seeing UB or, or waiting after the show and, and, and meeting UB and just the, the, the wave of warmth and love that would flow from this man and his desire to be a part of it and to be present. A lot of times people would think that UB's age was a real restriction on him, but it wasn't at all. And he went to Philadelphia to do this large concert and uh, there was no piano on the stage. It was in the orchestra pit, which I guess was open at the time. And, you know, it was his first performance, like public performance in many, many years. And he sat down and, and then he got up and he turned around and he said, you know, uh, I've been playing, you know, I've been playing the piano for 70, 75 years and everybody thought he was going to, you know, make some sort of explanation about why his fingering might not be together. And he said, this is the first time I've ever performed with my back to an audience. <laughs> and they turned around and they just gave him a rousing cheer. And then he gave the most astounding performance that any of them had seen come from anybody. Just his fingers were always together. He was really just truly a special man. A team that completely was lost that you brought back with Shuffle Along are um, Miller and Lyle. Yes. Who were playwrights. Yes, yes. So tell us a little bit about them and how they fit into this. Well, Fl Florina Miller and Aubrey Lyles met at Fisk University. Um, and uh, Aubrey Lyles was studying medicine, and Flora Norrie's father was, uh, was the editor of a newspaper somewhere, and they were both from Tennessee, and they started putting on little school skits and performances, and they fit together perfectly as a team, and then they then, after school, they, they went to Chicago and, and, did, uh, and worked for a black theater there. And then they were discovered, and then they were touring around on the Keith Albee circuit and became right. very successful. They became very successful as blackface performers. And, uh, and so they were this huge top draw and very smart, very well educated. And then they met uh, Cicel and Blake at a benefit and that said, people tell us our material's great, but we need songs if we want to make it to Broadway. And they said, well, we've got great songs and we've been looking for material. And then, and they formed this partnership and that's how it happened. And it's, they're, they're really fascinating guys because Florinoy lived to, lived at least into the seventies and Aubrey died uh, just before the revival of 33. Yeah. Yes. Died he died a very died young. young man. Yeah. Yes. He died very, very young. And he was a very, flamboyant, very uh, outspoken, uh, 
very funny, but very aggressive personality and was incredibly very short. And they had, at one point in Shuffle Along, they would stop the show, literally and literally, and they would put on a 25 to 30 minute boxing skit yeah. <laughs> that the, that people would come back to see over and over it and over and over it needless to say we did we explored it we explored it and we, <laughs> we explored it and we explored it out of the room yeah <laughs> which is a nice segue into my question for the actors so we have with us one of the great uh, uh, American directors, one of the great theater directors, George C. Wolfe. So mm -hmm. give us a sense. Pretend he's not here, Adrian. Oh, okay. Give us a sense of what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> he's not here. What right. it's like to go to work for George C. Wolfe. I would go to work with George C. Wolfe <laughs> <laughs> any day of my career if I'm blessed to keep having a career after the show. <laughs> I, because... The rehearsal room from the beginning is made to be such a safe space. Mm -hmm. And we, and he wants us all to play constantly. And he wants you to fail and he, because he wants to see what brilliance comes out of that failure. And he inspires you as an artist to delve deep into yourself, to find whatever you can find, as well as working with him to find something special and brilliant and different. And I am so grateful. Now, when you do, though, fail, how does George C. Wolf convey to you that this <laughs> bit is perhaps not working? He will say... <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, uh, he will coming your say, way, <laughs> He will say, well, let's try something else. <laughs> In that way. And, that's and he'll it. make you laugh about it as well. And, yeah. you, and, and you can... He really... Uh, He's just very, he's a very, very special man. And, I'm and uh, yeah. <laughs> when you fail, Brandon, how did that? Oh, George. <laughs> uh, you know, um, when I fail, it's hard to answer that question, Michael. Oh, jeez. I will say, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll say this about George, you know, and I, and I, 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 I tell people this uh, often. You know, when you, when you enter a room for the first time, you're really trying to figure out what your place is in this mechanism and how best to uplift the piece and what you have to give, what you have to hold back, et cetera. And with George, he's, he's one of the, the few people who you know rather immediately just how special he is. And I recognized immediately I'm here to, to listen and give. Mm -hmm. um, give all I can and absorb all that I can. And, mm, mm, okay. Now, not just George isn't here, you are here. <laughs> listen and give. <laughs> Part of the way I listen is by asking yes. questions and challenging True. things. <laughs> so, um, but you listen and you give, and, and uh, he challenges you and he invites the challenge himself. And one of the best things that, 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 that George can say for me is when, when you discuss, as you dissect a piece or, yeah. or dissect the piece, you ask him a question and sometimes he's like, I don't know, let's figure it out. And he has the confidence uh, to know that we have the tools in the room to figure it out. Right. We'll get there. Right. You know, maybe we need to learn part A before we learn part B, or maybe we learn part D before we learn part B, but we'll get there. Mm. Let's trust it. Let's explore. Let's, let's live. You know, that's, I mean, I think George has a, a real recognition of, of how he has become his, or fought to become his greatest self and become the great artist that he is. And so he really seeks to empower us and, and, and provide us with the environment and the tools to become our greatest selves, to protect us and to, and to lift us up so that his work and Savion's work falls away and right. so that we can live and exist. But George, you also wrote this show too. So do you come to the f rehearsal when you've cast everybody? Your book is set in stone or are you willing to... Nothing <laughs> said it. Throw the <laughs> I mean, Nothing, I mean no. are your lines so precious that, like Edward no. Albee, you know, when no. Edward comes no. in with a play, you, you no. do the play the way Edward Albee wrote it. <laughs> no. No. no, one of the things which I say all the time, an audience can tell when they're in the presence of a truth that was discovered just for them, and they can tell when you've recycled something. Uh. They can smell it. They can feel it. And so I've done a lot of shows and a lot of different kinds of shows, so I have a lot of weapons but I like to let go of those weapons so that therefore I can, so that I can be virginal to the material for lack of better words. And, and if I'm writing something and, and if I've written something, I, 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 I just have this feeling that, that something is either, is either growing or it's dying. You know, nothing is stasis, nothing is as is. So, so, so as you're working on material, you're you're investing it with growth and sometimes that growth comes from an actor sometimes that growth comes from oh this this line needs to not be this or this line needs to be that so you just have to be available available to the process because 
if you create a smart room, and by smart room I mean that you invite as, as smart, gifted people in the room who have varying types of articulation, then all the answers are there. And so you just have to discover and play. I remember, I think I'm very early, very early on, I was doing a show in college, and it was something I'd written and, and I was directing. And I was working with a composer who wasn't very good. And, um, <laughs> and, and the cast was over in the corner, and they were making all this noise, and they were driving me insane because I was trying to solve a problem. Just at the point where I was getting really annoyed, they were over in the corner solving the problem. And so that's, that's how theater works. That's, that's how theater works. You, I, I like I like a sense of an, of like anarchy, mm -hmm. and and you know which at any given moment you know I can roar and go ah no we're not doing that <laughs> but I, I like I like that sense of anarchy because because then everybody else is discovering what they don't know right everybody else is dangling somewhere out there in in this weird state of 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 what's going to happen next right. and and then the work feels fresh and then the work feels new and then everybody is up on stage shining with a kind of energy saying look what i've discovered for you right as opposed to yeah you've seen me do this again right you yep. know yep. and then there's this thing that happens but, which is theater but this is very much though what shuffle along is about yeah because they don't really know what they have when right. they're out of town and they're discovering and creating as they're going along solving very technical problems and in some cases financial problems like we don't have any money to get on the train to go to philadelphia right. Right. Every no. case. Right. and, we don't, and we don't have enough money for scenery and so somebody <laughs> yeah. sends them a or trunk costume. of smelly <laughs> costumes and then they got to turn a number mm -hmm. into them and that's one of the reasons why i really want to live in the show because you live inside of the energy of the show because you know you come to new york and then you have you have hits and you go oh they love me and then you have there you go oh they hate me and then you go oh they love me and all this sort of crap and you cultivate all this <laughs> armor and then that which is kind of essential and stupid and so I wanted to live inside of that energy that I had when I first came to New York right of of G kids let's put on a show mm -hmm. you yeah. know I wanted to I wanted to go back to that you know there was some there was some article that Frank Rich summarizing the season the season that nine happened and he was talking about the seasons unfold as it is and there was the, the final line was and who knows at this time on the Upper West Side in a small apartment there's some young mind who has a vision for the American theater and it is no pipe dream and I went he knows about me he doesn't know <laughs> You know, ego is always, always exactly. <laughs> you know, and it's and it's just that sense of that stupid blind belief and faith that you have to have at the beginning of your career. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to create a show that celebrated that stupid blind faith that you have to have. Yeah. And everybody who made this show had this same kind of stupid blind faith. <laughs> Who comes into New York eighteen thousand dollars in debt, which is the equivalent of two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars, mm -hmm. and ends up a hit? Yeah. 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 Doesn't happen. So, but they did it because failure was not an option. Yeah. I mean, it was a big option, but for them, <laughs> they you know they just plowed forward. So it's that's that's the energy that I wanted to. I, I wanted to live there again, and right. I wanted to be in a room with people who were living there as well. I've got to wrap it up in one minute, but let's just go back to we know. Little George up there in his apartment reading Frank Rich saying he knows about me. Can you give us a sense, Adrian, when it all began for you? I mean, the first time you fell in love with the theater, something you were in or something you saw, you thought, yeah. I, have to, I have to work in this world somehow. Well, um, the first time I'd ever seen a show, uh, I remember it was Once Upon a Mattress, and I was sitting on my mother's lap, and I looked at her, and I was maybe six years old at the time, and I said, Mom, I'm going to do that. She had no idea what I meant at the time <laughs> and what that would all entail. But I knew from very early on, I was also an athlete, so I knew I wanted to do that, but I stopped growing. So that dream <laughs> that came, to a halt. <laughs> came to a quick halt. And I had to get serious about my theater training because I, I knew that's where my passion, my heart lived there. Mm. And, um, and, and now I'm here and I'm grateful for it. Yes. Yeah. And uh, not that you were into musicals when you were growing up, Brandon, but... <laughs> I absolutely was. Yeah. I absolutely <laughs> really? It really? was. We did, I had a wonderful, wonderful school growing up. We had a music class every day. We did three musicals a year. The junior high, they did a Shakespeare play every year. Where was so that? Where was This that? is Rockville, Maryland, Christ Episcopal School. Oh. Uh, Bert Worth ran the program, and, you know, she... She really, both my, my brother and I, because my brother is six years older than I is, but he did all of, he started all the musicals, and so then I just did the same thing as I, as I grew up, and 
But you know, I, so I've always had a love and I've known from a very early age that this is exactly what I was gonna do. It's one of the reasons I came to New York to go to Columbia so that I could audition while I was in school. So he could be in Shuffle Alone, just like <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. 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 Yeah. But my first Broadway show was Ragtime in high right. school, sitting in the very last row with those little binoculars, watching Stokes and Audra. And I mean, I've, I've idolized them, particularly Stokes, you know, cause he's a leading man, but I idolized him since, since that day. And, uh, and so to be in this production. Um, Must be a thrill for you. Yeah, not only with, with George and Savion, but with, with people like Stokes and Audra and, and Billy, it's, it's an absolute Absolutely. dream. This is, it, you know, it's very special. We're really excited to be right. here. Well, the show is uh, Shuffle Along, or the making of the musical sensation of 1921. And all that followed, uh, mm. created by George C. Wolfe, with, we must say, superb choreography by Savion Glover. Absolutely. I mean, I've been watching Savion since he was... Yep. Right. <laughs> um, but, I mean, he's really emerged into a major force as a choreographer. Brilliant choreographer. Is Brilliant he? performer, too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And he's come, and by the way, we should say he's going to come into the show. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Specialty, is he, he going to bring back the boxing segment for him? <laughs> exactly. 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 With himself. Imagine. Exactly. Exactly. With the feet. Exactly. <laughs> All right. George C. Wolf, um, creator of Shuffle Along, thank you for being our thank guest. Thank you very on much. Broadway. The lovely Adrian Warren, Tony nominated for her performance in Shuffle Along. Thank you. And our good friend, Brandon Victor Dixon, uh, who plays UB Blake. Yes, sir. Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.